Welcome to our Camino Wildlife Habitat project and tonight's program bringing back the, or to bring back the pollinators and I will introduce Catherine momentarily but first I want to tell you a little bit about our um, Camino Wildlife Habitat project. So Camino is an island in harmony with nature one yard at a time by getting um, a lot of people to certify their yards as backyard wildlife habitats and provide um, food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. So you can see there's been a lot of habitat loss. So if we think about what we're doing in our yards, that can sort of restore some of the habitat and provide some corridors. Thinking about Russell Link's idea of areas in our backyards, with an area one being where you're in the, that space a lot. So that might be where you put your bird feeders so you can see them and where you do a lot of walking around. Uh, area two is more of a, a travel zone and area three is, is like the backyard or the back 40 or depending on how large your space is. And those back areas can actually link up and restore some corridors. So we're hoping to do that on the island and, um, and kind of make the parks that we have on the island link up. So it's, um, it's not hard to do. It it's, uh, takes a little time to do it all. You can't do it all at once. So when I moved to the island, we did not have a wildlife habitat um, in the front there. We did in the back of our, we have a strip. And so in the back, it was pretty rustic. But in the front, there was a lawn. And, um, and so the, the picture is in, um, we moved to the island in November of 94. So this is like January of that winter. And then 2007 is where we had, by that time, um, landscaped the south half of the yard. So, and then starting to do a little bit on the, the north side of the pathway there. And then now it's, it's really quite lovely. So on the hot days that we will have this summer, I go up there and it's lush and green and, and our neighbors both to the north and south have lawn and maybe one tree and it's it's kind of hot and dry and uh, and not wildlife habitat because if you think of grass and a tree it parked out it's pretty sterile so with the thinking of ground cover and shrubs and trees you've got various elevations and it does a lot for the wildlife okay and I mentioned that to have a wildlife habitat is providing for food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. And water can be as simple as the bottom of a, a pot you, that you um, just add a little bit of rocks and such so it doesn't have a steep side. And, um, and that will suffice for a water habitat. And in these warm days, they, um, they're, at first when we started, people were worried about the norovirus, no norovirus, um, West what? Nile, yeah. West yeah, Nile. West Nile virus. I'm thinking of the <laughs> ships and <laughs> the West Nile virus. And and you know, in the summer, the water um, sources that we have are really, you know, when you put out a bird bath, it's it's not really. It's I need to fill it up a few times a day because it's evaporating and they're using it. So it's it's really not a concern. It's it's like. Um, old tires that are, are accumulating water and just are sitting there, that type of thing is what would be a problem. And besides thinking about um, food, water, shelter, and places to raise young, it's also thinking about responsible um, gardening. So uh, eliminating some of the lawn, using native plants, all that's really nice living on an island when we have our uh, sole source aquifer. And then you don't have to be a purist, so you know, as you get into it more, the, it's, it's kind of thinking, oh, maybe I don't want to use the pesticides or the fertilizers. And, um, and maybe uh, I do have space to do some composting. So as you, as you do it, you kind of build a consciousness. And, and that's kind of one reason to do it. I know when I, now that I'm a certified wildlife habitat, when I go out to get plants, I think of ones that are going to, if they're not native plants, they're ones that are going to still be beneficial to the wildlife and not something exotic that's sterile. And, and so it, it may bloom, but it's not really doing anything versus, um, you know, like um, the Oregon grape has those beautiful flowers in the, in the spring and then it has the grapes later on. So it has multiple things it's doing. The red flowering currant brings in the, um, the hummingbirds in the springtime. So it's thinking about what we're doing and you can, as a community or a neighborhood, you can kind of 
work together and, and it becomes a, a bigger deal than just one yard, it becomes several. And so that does have an impact. So to be a certified wildlife habitat, it's a simple way to sh check food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. You can find, uh, if you're on, living on Kameno, you can find an application that's specific for Kameno in that we get it and mail it into the National Wildlife Federation. So one, I can count, see how many we, ha we have. We have 1,043 now. And two, I kind of bird dog it through the National Wildlife Federation in case um, sometimes they, they take a while to get processed. You can also, so you can get the application on our website. You can also certify directly with the National Wildlife Federation. And I have applications at the library that you can grab both inside near the hall that goes to the bathroom and outside in the kiosk. And, um, or I can mail you one too. But you can, you can actually be real quick and certify online too. And then once you've certified, you can put up a sign. And when you do that, people call me and say, well, I could be a wildlife habitat. How do you do it? So it's great advertising. It also works nicely for yard art because oh, um, sometimes wildlife habitats can be a little messier because like you're keeping the seeds on the plants and you're letting things dry up a little bit. So you, you're not pruning as excessively and sometimes the, the ground cover doesn't look as, um, oh, it's, it's a little wilder than uh, a lawn. And so the habitat signs help. Also, yard art does a good job, too. So if you want the Camino sign, I just need to know that you're certified, and I can meet you at the library. It's $15. And, when you, and I need to know your certification number. And you can also certify online, and once you have your number, you can get a sign from the National Wildlife Federation as well. So this is the Ranger Rick version because they spawn there. That's their kids' activity with the National Wildlife Federation. Then you can see we have a lot of dots on the island. All of these are certified wildlife habitats. So it's spread out all throughout the island. We have some neighborhoods within our community habitat, and you can see there's quite a few community wildlife habitats in um, Washington. Like there are 18, and in the nation there are now 152. Kameno was the second in Washington State and we were the tenth in the nation. So it's a real action step for communities. And so you can find out more information from the National Wildlife Federation as well as our website. Roxy's done a terrific job with our website. So you can go look around in that. We have a native plant list. We have um, recordings of programs like the, the How to Landscape the Drain Field. That's a real hit. Um, people like that. We have a, a last month's native plant um, information's on there. So that's not only are there um, recordings, they also have program resources that you can take a look at as well. And there's these two, uh, three books. The two on the on the top, Living with Wildlife and Landscaping for Wildlife, are done by Russell Link, who is a Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fish and Wildlife um, for Washington State um, biologist. And then the uh, the one below is done by a National Wildlife Federation naturalist. So the top two are real Washington State oriented. And with that, that is, um, we're a community wildlife habitat. Thanks to many of you who are here. And, and if you have don't know how to certify and would like to, um, we, we're just counting away and we'd like to, to join in the program. And um, with that, I will stop sharing and I will tell you a little bit about Catherine before she um, gives tells us about pollinators. So with that, um, Catherine Owen, she is a volunteer ambassador with the Xerxes Society for um, Invertebrate Conservation, and she is um, she's been an edu in, she's called herself an informal educator for thirty years, um, and she's introduced people to wildlife as well as encouraging action. And so wildlife habitats and neighborhood habitats and community wildlife habitats are our action step on Kameno. Um, she founded the Woodland Park Zoo's audience research department. And with that, she conducted research to see how people attending the zoo, going to the zoo, how that um, in, affected their, um, their like for um, and their care for the um, insects and various wildlife. And besides that, she lives on the Kitsap Peninsula and is active with her wildlife habitats with both her neighbors and the community. So with that,
Catherine Owen is here. And thank you so much, Catherine, for letting us know about the pollinators. They need help. <laughs> sure. Thank you. I am. Um... Um, and I really appreciate the chance to speak to you all tonight. I think that everything that Val said about wildlife needing places to raise young and food and shelter and so on, um, of course, applies to insects. And so one of, that's one of the things that we'll be talking tonight is, is a little bit about um, the life cycle of insects, what their needs are, what their particular needs are in terms of kind of deconstructing some of the main categories of pollinators and then talking about things that some of the threats that they're facing, which I think we're probably pretty aware of. We hear a lot about threats, so that's going to be fairly brief, but um, and then really wanted to focus on things that we can do to make a difference. I think I um I I am the type of person that wants to know that my actions are making a difference. Like I want hard evidence. <laughs> and so I've been really interested in some of the research that's been going on about the importance of backyard habitat and how it really is helping um, animals that are wildlife that is really being are really being squeezed, especially between climate change and habitat loss, kind of in a vice grip there, and trying to give them a little bit of breathing room. And and so any um, these types of green spaces really help. So um, as Val mentioned, I um, am a volunteer ambassador for the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. We, Xerxes has been around, um, some folks might have, you may be members or might have heard of them before, but we've been around since 1971. Robert Michael Pyle, if you're familiar at all with butterflies, especially in the Northwest, you're familiar with him because he's written some wonderful books on butterflies. And he was actually the founder of Xerxes. And then of course it's expanded quite a bit since then. Um, but it was nay, it's a strange name. Whenever I'm talking in public, people are struggling with trying to pronounce it. And I always want to change the name, but um, it's named after the first butterfly in the US that was became extinct because of human activity, which is this little friend in the right, the far right of that image on the left, the Xerxes blue butterfly, which went extinct in the 19 became extinct in the 1940s. <clears throat> So the um, the areas that Xerxes works in um, are mentioned up here, conservation, advocacy, research, and education. Uh, it's only in the last few years that the ambassador program that I'm part of has really, um, has really started to take off. So what we're trying to do is really get more people out there that can help to spread the word. Um, if anyone is ever interested in um, in becoming an ambassador, you can always reach out to Xerxes. There's a lot of information on their website about that process, but um, it's really a great, I think it's really a great program. We, um, to give you one example actually of conservation at conservation and research in particular, Xerxes recently worked with the uh, US Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the US Forest Service to develop a conservation plan, a management strategy for bumblebees in Washington state. So we're the first state in the country that has a conservation strategy for bumblebees. And that's based on a huge amount of research that has been done through community science uh, over since about 2018, a huge number of bumblebee studies that have been um, conducted around the state. And there's quite a comprehensive now idea of what the different populations are, which species are in trouble. And so this management plan really helps in terms of giving landowners and public folks that manage public lands advice in terms of how they can apply best practices for managing and keeping populations of bumblebees in their areas um, healthy. So uh, Xerxes works in a number of different countries. Um, it's based in, was founded in Portland and that's where the office is in Portland, Oregon, but um, it's expanded quite a bit around the world. And that's how we're kind of able to do a lot of the work that we do is that we work pretty closely with a lot of different partners from land agencies on federal, state and local levels to um, farmers, corporations. Uh, I just saw something from, I think it was Annie's Foods that um, they are trying to promote pollinators. What I forget what the product is now. That mac and cheese that doesn't make sense. Anyways, <laughs> some uh, I should look that up before I give another example of a company. <laughs> that was the one that came to mind. <laughs> so um, this is probably you probably guys probably all have an answer to this question. Why care about pollinators? You know, 
certainly I'm of the belief that every species of wildlife has intrinsic value. And so I kind of bristle when we talk only about what they can do for us, right? But they can do, they do an enormous amount for us, which is important not to lose sight of. Um, Pollination 101, I think this is uh, not going to be a deep dive. Basically, I'm, I'm sure that you guys are familiar with this, that pollination simply means that the grains of pollen are being transferred from the male stamen or anther on a flower to the female stigma on a flower, um, on another flower. And um, while flowers, so there are a number of pollinators, um, different categories of pollinators, wind and water do um, per, play the role of pollinators for some crops, but primarily animals. So insects, birds, hummingbirds. Um, there was a great program recently on PBS Nature on hummingbirds in Costa Rica that really talked about their value to the ecosystem and in particular around pollination. That I think it was just came out about two weeks ago that was really excellent. Um, bats, you may have heard, also play a role in pollination, mostly tropical crops. Um, some Chocolate plants and uh, chocolate as well as bananas, bats are one of their pollinators. The scientists estimate based on the research that about 85% of flowering plants require a critter to move the pollen. And um, we estimate that one in three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume was, is there because of a pollinator making that possible. Um, this is, I thought, really interesting. This is a whole foods market in the I think this was in the Bay Area, it was in California. A couple of years ago, they did a project. Um, they wanted to show, show consumers kind of what the value, what the importance of pollinators was. And so this is their produce section with all of our pollinators intact. And if the pollinators disappear, this is what the produce section would look like. So over half of the produce items sold at the store would, would disappear. And it's, um, I, I like this image. I think it's pretty powerful image imagery of um, why insects matter. And especially as we're talking about tonight, um, the valuable role that pollinators play. I think it's, it was interesting news to me when I thought about um, Whole Foods also did the same thing with their dairy case. So not just the produce aisle, but the dairy case. And so here's the before with all of our pollinator friends intact and here's without them. Um, and that can seem surprising, at least it did to me the first time that I looked at that, um, because I was thinking, well, what are the, you know, is it fruit that pollinate? Is it fruit and yogurt? You know, is that the big impact? Well, really, um, the big impact is uh, dairy feed. So alfalfa, for instance, is pollinated uh, largely by um, bees called al alkali bees. Uh, Leafcutter bees also pollinate alfalfa, but um, and both of them are much more efficient pollinators of alfalfa than honeybees. Alfalfa plants have a little, their structure is such that when an animal goes in there to get the pollen, a part of the plant, the flower drops in their head. Honeybees apparently do not go for this. And so they go kind of down underneath and they sneak in to get the nectar. But alkali bees will just take it. <laughs> they will go right in there. And so they're getting pollen on themselves as well which is why they, they are more effective. Um, if you're interested in alkali bees, I um, was recently reading about Walla Walla. Um, the Walla Walla, some valleys around Walla Walla have been, farmers have been working with alkali bees for decades, trying to provide habitat, nesting habitat for them. They nest in the ground um, because they play such an important role in um, pollination of alfalfa plants. The farmers have really, um, created kind of these special rows for them. You can, uh, it's such a cool story. I could get bogged down if I begin telling the story, but you can, if you Google alkali bees and Walla Walla, you'll find a really interesting um, history of kind of that story over time. They've got kind of specific interesting needs in terms of nesting habitat that the farmers are trying to work with them on. <laughs> um, of course, in addition to pollinators, you know, there's a, a lot of other, in addition to the food that we eat, of course, there's a lot of important things that pollinators do for the rest of the natural world. So not only do they, uh, does their efforts result in fruit and seeds that many animals eat, they, um, they often are the food themselves, right? So insects um, uh, estimated about almost 100%. So 96% of terrestrial birds in North America 
rear their young on insects or other arth arthropods. Um, it, you don't think about this so much sometimes with hummingbirds, right? Because you're thinking, well, they're drinking nectar all the time and maybe that's what they feed their young. But you can't grow bones very well on just nectar. So especially when they're young, when they have young offspring that are in the nest, they collect a ton of insects. Um, they uh, black cap chickadees, which um, are a wonderful critter that we have around here. Um, one pair can bring four to six hundred caterpillars to their nest every day to feed their um, their young. You figure. Black cap chickadees are in the nest about 15 to 20 days. So that can be 10, uh, 10, 000, up to 10,000 caterpillars that they would need. So um, so insects obviously are a huge one. Just one other example for those of you who have been to Yellowstone National Park or enjoy the park. Um, they recently found that grizzly bears in the park up in kind of higher elevation are eating miller moths and they can eat up to 40,000 of these moths a day. Um, they didn't used to apparently eat these moths back in the days when it was okay to drive through Yellowstone and feed marshmallows by hand to a bear or feed a loaf of bread to a bear. Um, I remember seeing that when I was a kid and was always angry that my parents wouldn't let me hand a marshmallow to a bear. But, but fortunately, that was outlawed. And so the bears kind of transition. And this is one of the huge food sources that they happened upon these miller moths that are down in the valleys um, until the summer. And then in the summertime, they come up into the, into where the tundra plants are and flowers. And um, there are huge numbers of them, like one rock, rocky slide, kind of an avalanche slide. The field could have thousands and thousands of moths and grizzly bears are just, have become really, um, really rely upon them. Um, I was reading, and a study that a graduate student did recently figured that a single moth has enough fat content to account for half of a calorie. So um, by turning over rocks and eating the moths, grizzly bears they estimated could come up with 20,000 calories in just moths every day. <laughs> so of course, um, you just other benefits of pollinators in terms of things that we enjoy, you know, um, seasons and holidays that we enjoy and the role that they play there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, checking the time here, talk a little bit about pollinator diversity. They, um, so there are, of course, um, oh, and I should mention, I am not great. I thought I, thought I was gonna have somebody help me tonight monitor the chat. I am not great at looking at the chat when I'm speaking. And so if Val or Roxy, if there's anything that you feel is urgent, um, feel free to interrupt me. Yeah. Otherwise, I think we'll, we'll be, do that. That'll be fine. Okay, it'd be great to wait till the end. So, of course, there are a lot of different animals that, that do pollination. Um, we're going to focus on bees today. Um, what I'm going to focus on are bees because bees are, um, we consider them the most important pollinator. So, a lot of animals get pollen on themselves when they are going and getting nectar at uh, or eating pollen at a plant. What's distinct about bees is that they're actually collecting the pollen and taking it back, excuse me, um, to the hive. They forage in the area around the nest and so they're spreading pollen through that area. And they also exhibit what, what's known as flower constancy. So they're seeking out certain flowers and going to, to each one of that kind that they see. Um, Pollen transport is, I think, a super interesting phenomenon, but um, some of the more primitive bees don't have, so you can see this guy on the left, um, this friend has a little basket on their rear legs, which is pretty common. Some of the more, most primitive bees didn't have specific structures, but the pollen would just stick onto their hairs. And then other ones have what they sometimes refer to as like a pollen brush, which are the pollen, they kind of collect it between special hairs on the back of their legs. Um, mason bees, uh, mason bees actually don't have these particular structures, but what they do is that they actually will kind of roll their bodies in pollen. And so um, the way that they carry pollen is one of the main reasons why they're such a great pollinator. So uh, honeybees, you know, it, 
um, honeybees, of course, from are from Europe. Um, the ones that we have in this country are not native. Of course, they're hugely important for pollinating crops. Um, they there have been, I'm sure that you've seen in the news a lot of concern about honeybees from colony collapse disorder to um, particular mites. There's a number of different issues, and there's still research going on in terms of exactly what what the main threats are, but. Um, but honeybees at this point, in spite of that, are not considered endangered. Um, and there are almost 3 million hives that are active, or were active as of last year in the U.S. Um, native bees. So native bees, we have thought, um, as long as there have been concerns about honeybees, which has been quite a long time, uh, because we're so reliant upon them, there has been the thought among um farmers and the industry in general, that native bees can be an important backup for honeybees when there are problems with honeybee colonies collapsing um, and succumbing to other types of diseases and other problems. But native bees are, are in significant trouble too. And so we really, um, really need to, and are really trying to focus on educating folks around their needs. So I'm gonna talk a bit about native bees for the next little bit. Um, most of these guys, native bees that we uh, find around here are solitary. So they're not in a hive, they're not living in a hive, which means that they are unlikely to sting you, right? So primarily you wanna sting if your life is in danger. So everybody has a story about stepping on a bee, right? Or grabbing a plant by mistake and there's a bee on it. But the other primary reason is to defend their nest. So the ones that don't have nests, like a mason bee, um, do not have that obligation. <laughs> so they're not as likely to sting. Um, native bees are with, um, as it says here, almost all crops are either the main pollinator or one of the most important pollinators to supplement uh, the activity of honeybees. In terms of number of species, um, there are way more species of native bees than uh, one would think. So in um, perhaps in the US and Canada, we figure that there's the, around 3,600 species. Washington state over 600 species of uh, native bees. Um, I don't, we don't, there isn't research yet on Seattle, but just for comparison, Portland, Portland alone in the city is 80 up to 100 different species. In a single garden, you could have 20 to 30 species. There was a really, this was in the UK, but there was a fabulous program. I think this was on PBS Nature also about a man who during the pandemic was a wildlife photographer and devoted his time to getting to know the bees in his backyard. Um, and he, it's an amazing show and it talks about the variety as well as just what he notices about the habits of all these different species and individuals. Uh, native bees come in very many different shapes and sizes. Um, this one here, I'm just looking at his name. Uh, that's really, oops, sorry. I don't have the name of that guy there on my sheet. Um, it's the largest bee that's, um, in the world. The other guy is, uh, the smallest bee, and his name is Perdita minima, which means it's a little lost bee. <laughs> and that bee, apparently the tiny one, can turn around within the space of a zero. If you were typing in like 12 point font, the zero, he could turn around there. <laughs> so they come in not only uh, many different sizes, but also many different colors. We're used to thinking about bees being yellow and black, but of course they come in uh, different hues as well, and often are not distinguished as identified as bees because of that fact. People don't recognize that that's what they are. Um, I mentioned before, just in terms of one of the other areas of diversity is the way that they carry pollen. Some of them have specific structures that can vary. Um, this guy here, this is a nocturnal bee. They can vary also in terms of the size of different body parts. So these are... Um, the two, he's got these two very large eyes on, on either side. And that's because he's adapted to live in low light levels. Um, and then he's got these other three smaller eyes. So most of our bees around here wouldn't have eyes that are this large, but it's one, one of the many things that can vary from bee to bee. <laughs> um, another one of which is their tongue length. So some bees, 
can really reach into a flower where there's a pretty long chamber and others like this friend here and uh, others aren't. Others really focus on shallower uh, nectar that's shallower and easier to get to. So in terms of the, the history of bees and kind of what leading into what they need really to be able to develop and um, and be healthy. So typically it's about a year long process. And um, here we're talking about the solitary bees which again are the majority of native bees. It's about a year long process um, of a bee's life cycle. So what happens is that they spend the big majority of that up until about the last month um, underground. And then they're up and around as an adult for a month of that time. But you can see here there, um, this kind of shows you from when they're an egg, um, and pupa, larva, and then when they actually hatch out. So underground is super important to, to bees. So one of the important needs that they have is access to bare soil, um, ideally bare soil. They can apparently, if if the grass is not, uh, is, is pretty short, as long as there are some little gaps in there, they can usually get into the ground. But ideally, what you do is kind of provide some bare ground for them. Um, ground and sandy soil, and that's because of kind of the substrate that they like to use to make their nests in. Uh, the picture on the left is it says resemble ant nests from above ground. These are not like the big ant thatching ant mounds that you sometimes see, but um, smaller ant mounds. So they're not, they often are not recognized. This picture on the right just shows you the many chambers that might be underground that those bees are living in. Um, and you can see up here, we'll get some other photos, but just showing you kind of what those cells look like within each of those chambers. So it mentioned, um, I think I skipped over this, but about 70% of our native bees are nesting underground. And then um, the rest of them primarily are nesting in tunnels. So that can be something like a mason bee box, um, which I, I think I've got an image of here, um, but it can also be these tunnels that are made by other creatures uh, beetles that make these tunnels in wood, bees will often use those for their little chamber when they're when the female bees are laying their eggs and need a place to raise their young. Um, they like to have um, you know, different bees use different things to construct those cells. So they separate each egg off from each other one. So those walls in between each little chamber, each individual chamber or cell are made of different materials that they might use from your yard. Um, damp ground and mud puddles, you know, mason bees like to, mason bees use mud. Um, I don't know if folks have ever seen this mason bee. We have mason bee boxes in our neighborhood. My husband made up a bunch of them for us and for our neighbors. And um, the female, I was watching the female one afternoon. She'd go in there and make all these trips and pack mud in and then disappear and then pack mud in. And then at the very end of the chamber when she's got it filled up, and usually it's about 10 cells within that chamber, she turned around and just patted the mud with her hind <laughs> legs, which was pretty, pretty amazing to see. But um, their earth that can produce mud when it's damp is really, um, is really helpful for them. Um, bumblebees are interesting, you know, bumblebees do live in, um, in groups, they are social, but they uh, they have, you know, much smaller nests than a honeybee hive, typically, and they also are underground. Um, and so the queen, there's a queen honeybee, she establishes the nest, lays the eggs. You can see kind of their life cycle here. Um, oops, sorry, the colony is growing. Um, after mating, the males die out. The colony is at its peak during the summertime. The males... Um, when the males leave nests, new queens leave to find a mate. So the mated queen is really the one that survives. And she will often be just kind of right under the ground, you know, maybe in your yard hanging out until the next year. So one of the questions that we sometimes get is people will notice that there's a bumblebee nest in their in their ground in the ground, somewhere in their yard or garden. And they'll want to get rid of the get rid of them. But generally you can wait until um if you wait until after winter when she's actually come back out again, um, that would be great to not disturb, not disturb her. Um, okay. So threats to pollinators. Um, 
Of course, habitat loss is a huge one, and there's a few different shapes that that takes. Um, certainly the loss of land for housing. There's also just the issue of um, the substrates that are used. So in many cases, that might be a lawn, which is treated with pesticides. So even though you see a grassy lawn, it could be completely inhospitable to, to uh, bees and other pollinators. And pesticides, um, probably not a surprise to folks, is a huge, sorry, just having a problem with my screen, um, is a huge problem. This is actually a photo that was taken in a, in an area in Portland a few years ago. So there was spraying that happened in a parking lot. They were spraying linden trees. And I don't know what the pest was that they were trying to get rid of, but they killed an estimated an estimated 10,000 bees died. And I was talking to somebody at a pr presentation recently who lived in Portland and she said it was all over the news and it was horrifying, the number of bees that were killed. And it was not an illegal operation, right? It was the folks that did it had the right to spray these trees. Now, now you cannot spray linden trees in Portland with pesticides after this happened. But it just is an example of sort of how pervasive, but also how highly toxic these things are to um, the pollinators, uh, especially bees, butterflies. So pesticides we often think of in terms of farming, you know, that they're primarily used in, in farms, but certainly urban gardens can have pretty heavy pesticide use. There's been some interesting research I've been following on uh, hummingbirds and pesticide loads in hummingbirds from the hummingbirds up in British Columbia, they've been studying because uh, blueberry fields have really taken off as a crop that's being grown in British Columbia and they there's pretty heavy use of pesticides. So the folks have been studying that have certainly found pesticides in hummingbirds up there, but also in city, um, in gardens in, um, in city of Victoria, people on Vancouver Island, people have been finding as high or higher levels of pesticides. So um, they're certainly there as well as in farms. You know, in climate change, I think um, obviously for all of us, it's a pretty clear and present danger, and it can also seem difficult to determine what you as an individual can do. Um, but, you know, what we really think, what I really think about is trying to give wildlife some breathing room, right, by helping make landscapes more resilient so that we can um, offer some some benefits and um, some ways that some of these creatures can can survive. And certainly, as we mentioned earlier, um, anything that you can do in your own backyard, um, place of work, and so on, can make a big difference. So, just to touch on honey honeybees again uh, briefly, um, because people often ask about, you know, when I'm at doing a table, well, should I set up a, a honeybee hive, you know, to help bees and um, there's certainly a good reasons to do that in terms of if you want honey, if you if you want to just enjoy the process and learn about honeybees, but we don't think of it as bee conservation. It's sort of like the analogy of chickens, right? If you wanted to help protect birds, you wouldn't necessarily start with chickens because they're being managed <laughs> um, as a domestic animal. So they are, uh, honeybees are certainly important, but they're not really the focus of our efforts yeah, when Xerxes in terms of conservation and what we're trying to encourage. So for that life cycle um, that we just kind of flew over briefly there, um, obviously bees, in order to carry that out, they need places to nest, they need materials to nest in, uh, flowers and pesticide-free environments are the three big, big items. Um, bumblebees use, um, they often use little hollows that they find. Uh, rodent holes, they like areas that have fur in them, <laughs> like a rodent hole, because it provides extra insulation. So as Val mentioned earlier, one of the things that we encourage people to do is to think about what, what on whatever scale you're able to do it, is to not, not worry as much about making everything tidy, but even long grass and some overgrown spots and little holes can provide really critical winter shelter. Um, for pollinators, bumblebees, but also um, uh, butterflies. Um, habitats, you know, even all of these are examples of, of habitat that's kind of in and around other an, an urban area or suburban area, but can also have a lot of value for uh, pollinators. Um, this is just 
uh, looking at kind of a typical uh, route that a, one single bee might make. And so you can see up here, kind of towards the upper right, shows him the ground nesting bee. He's maybe, that's maybe where he starts off from, maybe, or this is his little home under the ground. And then it just kind of shows you that the land, the area that he could cover um, when he's foraging in a single day. And so it's really kind of like a patchwork, right? He's kind of being able, to, he's able to collect pollen and, and get enough from this combination of different backyards, um, curbs along the, along the gardens that are grown on curbs alongside the street and so on. Flowers, of course, we, we know that uh, flowers are important for animals that pollinate. Um, in general, bees will drink nectar from any any flower that works for them that's accessible, but they don't they have a somewhat more limited selection in terms of where they collect pollen from. Um, native plants, of course, are, are the best. Um, they are what animals in this area are adapted for. They provide, especially if you can time it so that you've got bloom as long over the growing season as possible. Um, late winter to late fall. And we talk about native plants. Um, one of the questions that we sometimes get from folks is, well, there's a lot of beautiful plants in the nursery that are cultivars, right? And are, they, are those good for pollinators? And, you know, it really varies quite a bit. Um, one thing that you can, uh, that we can sort of count on is that if a plant has double blossoms, it is usually not good for pollinators. It is more difficult for a for a pollinator to get into the nectar supply and the pollen. Um, and often they are not good producers of pollen. Um, they spend, the plant is spending its energy on other things like making double blossoms as opposed to pollen. And so they tend not to, as a rule, double bloom plants are not great for pollinators. Um, and then in terms of other plants, you know, it's, we've got, if you go to the Xerxes website and at the end of the presentation, I'll put a bunch of links up here for you, but, um, there are, we've got a, one of the books that we have is called Feed the Bees um, that we published. You can find that also, not just from Xerxes, but on Amazon, and I see it in our local nurseries. And it tells you about a lot of the different plants that are in particular that are beneficial for bees, but especially plants in the aster family, like daisies, coneflowers, of course, lavender, rosemary, um, ceanothus, also known as California wild lilac, I believe, is a fabulous plant for bees. We've got one in our front yard that just is uh, buzzing all season. Uh, Oregon grape, I think, was Val mentioned earlier, is a great one. Um, you you know, when you go to a nursery, um, often often you'll get, well, actually, we'll get into, I guess I'll get into that here. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But um, I think one of the other really legitimate, important questions is if you go to a nursery, are you guaranteed that that plant that you're buying has not been treated with pesticides. Um, especially if it's a systemic pesticide or insecticide that stays in the plant, it can stay in the plant for a long time. It is throughout the plant system. So every part, plant of the, part of the plant is affected. It, um, pesticides, one of the ones that, um, one of the systemic ones that you've probably heard about are referred to as neonics or neonicotinoids. Um, those are extremely toxic to bees and other pollinators, but um, but even even other insecticides. Um, and one of the links that I'll give you actually has a list of things that you can watch out for. And I'll I think I'll talk a little bit about nurseries towards the end. I've got time to go into that a little bit more. Um, so again, bare ground in terms of uh, meeting the needs of bees, having bare ground for them to nest in. It's an example of the mason bee blocks, which block which I mentioned, which is the ones. Those are two different models on the top and the bottom. Um, there are instructions online, and one of the links I'll provide tells you how you can maintain your how to create the mason bee box if you want to make one yourselves. You can often buy them now at nurseries. Um, you can also buy little packs of mason bees and actually kind of jumpstart it with like a little sleeve of them or a little. Um, um, what is the word for that? Things sticking out. Straw, like a straw made of wood or willow straw. Um, you can buy those with bees in them, although generally what I've been told is that if you build it, they will come. So if you make the home for them, they will find it 
um, and use it. You don't necessarily need, need to buy bees to stock it with. And you can't always be sure that the bees, um, the species that are being sold are native mason bees which is the other challenge. Um, and in the, the link that I'll mention, or that I'll give you at the end, also talks about how to clean these out. So that's one of the important things to prevent diseases is that if you are gonna go with a nest box for a nest block for mason bees, um, it's important to be able to clean it every every year to, to prevent diseases from affecting the bees. And this just shows you kind of the end of that little tunnel that she's made there. A few other things that are super helpful. Uh, one is leaving the leaves. So leaving the, a thin layer of leaves underground, not enough that it's going to smother the turf, but um, a thin enough layer so that all the critters that are going to overwinter there are going to be safe and have a spot to be able to overwinter in. Uh, plants. So the critters, the bees that really like to, that are tunnel nesters that like to nest in that kind of environment. One of the things that um, is really valuable are plants that have hollow stems. So there's a few examples here listed on the slide because sometimes bee, female bees will actually use those for their nest. And so it's a great idea to um, not worry about pruning all of those dead stalks right away, but to leave them for a while. Um, so that bees can actually take advantage of them and the bees can hatch out safely. This is uh, similar for wildlife, right? Especially, especially reptiles and small mammals, but also um, insects. So stick and rock piles are helpful and it can be, you know, again, on whatever scale that you have, doesn't necessarily have to be grandiose, but just an area where it's not completely maintained and manicured and that there are places for animals to kind of uh, go in to get shelter. One of the things that um, actually was promoted first developed by a group called Plant Life in the UK, which is a, a really great organization. So they started to try and popularize no mow may or leaving your lawn in the spring. Um, dandelions are such an important plant for bees because they come out early. They're one of the often one of the first flowers that a bee is going to be able to have access to. And so I understand this can be I was speaking to folks at a public garden the other day, and this can be a, a hard sell to leave dandelions in your lawn in terms of just concerns about perceptions. But you can, like the backyard habitat signs, you can get a sign that says you're participating in no mow may. That's why your lard, yard looks the way it does for that month <laughs> that you're helping out. Uh, and of course, avoiding pesticides. Um, you know, we, we sometimes um, say, as the slide mentions here, that if you feel that you need to use them for one particular issue to follow the instructions carefully, but, you know, most pesticides, even when you follow the label instructions um, carefully, are still pretty bad news for native bees. So um, nursery plants, and I mentioned this a, a bit ago, um, how do you know whether or not the plant you're getting has been treated? So that um, that's difficult to tell. You can't tell just by looking at it, right? Unless you can certainly at a nursery or at a public park, wherever you happen to see flowering plants, a great idea is to look and see where the pollinators are going, where the bees are going, because that's a sign that that's a plant that they um, will enjoy and will attract them. But you really need to have conversations with folks at the nursery to find out how the plants were grown. Very often a nursery is not growing their own plants, but they're getting them from a wholesale supplier. And so one of the things that we um, provide on our on our website is a lot of great talking, kind of a list of great talking points for who do you talk to at your nursery? Who's the person who's most likely to know how the plants were treated? And then what are some of the questions you can ask to make sure that you're not buying plants that are gonna be a problem? We've also got a guide for nurseries in terms of some of the simple things that they can do to deal with some common concerns that they have around pests and alternative ways that can work for a nursery on a, a larger scale than someone's backyard. Um, because that, uh, so again, it, it really, you really need to kind of do that research and chat with them. And, you know, it can take time and, of course, effort to be able to, to develop that relationship with somebody at the nursery and to really find out where the plants are coming from, but um, it's super important to, 
to look out for that and try and get as much information as you can. Um, and of course, all the things that we're talking about doing for pollinators in terms of habitat will attract other kinds of helpful insects such as ladybugs, ladybug larva. Um, this is an adult and I have a picture of the larva. I should because they're amazing looking. They look like little dragons, but they just are killers when it comes to aphids. They can eat an enormous amount of aphids. And so they are super helpful um, uh, ladybugs and their offspring to have around in your yard. And certainly the things that we're talking about doing will, will help attract them too. Our Bring Back the Pollinator campaign, there is a pollinator um, pledge that you can sign. Um, and there's information about how you can take each of these steps at the Bring Back the Pollinators website or page within the Xerxes site um, that talks about how do you do each of these things? What are pollinator friendly flowers? There's a, we've got a pretty extensive list of plants that tend to be good for pollinators um, that are on the website also. So there's a lot of information resources for each of those four steps that can help you out. If you're interested in looking at of not just your backyard, but how do you do something on a little bit larger scale? Um, one of the things that we're trying to promote are bee cities. And so those are really, you know, probably similar to backyard habitat in terms of really trying to get as many um, folks, both in terms of public uh, spaces, as well as people on a private um, private level in their own backyards, is to do take steps that, we're ta that I've been talking about to help bees and to try and do that throughout your community. B Campus is just the college version of, uh, well, K through 12, as well as college version of that. Um, the X Kids program, we have an activity booklet that you can order, which is primarily focused on grades three to five. It's available in Spanish as well as English. Um, it's a really awesome booklet. So a, a kid can work through the booklet and then they kind of get a badge that says that they're an X kid and they get kind of plugged in if they want to be to different activities that they can get involved in and um, get a lot of suggestions on ways that they can help bees themselves. And then community science projects. Um, a few that we run are listed up here. So Bumblebee Watch, I think, is probably the easy, easiest entry in terms of community science projects. So that is really, it really boils down to just going out in your yard with your cell phone, taking pictures of bees, uploading them to a website, and then it gives you guidance guidance in terms of how to identify what bee you're seeing. Um, bees, I, I find I find it when I first started doing this, it was hard to identify because they're often moving. And so you're trying to figure out, okay, is that yellow stripe on the rear back leg or something on the band? But the Bumblebee Watch website has this fantastic guides that show sketches of each bee that are really helpful in identification. So you go ahead and upload your photos, you try and identify it, and then we have experts that come and look at all the identification to make sure that they're all accurate. Northwest, Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, that's how all of the work was done through that community science project that was the basis for the conservation strategy developed for bumblebees in the state. Um, that's a little bit more intense in that you have to catch the bee so catch them with a net, uh, most likely, and then you put them into a cold, like a cooler for a little bit, which slows them down so that you can actually take a look at them. And then there are a number of different things that you need to try and identify a note on there. So that's a little bit more involved. Um, the Western Monarch Milkweed Project is a big project. We don't, in this area, mainly um, you would see monarchs in the eastern part of the state, so not so much in Western Washington. Uh, so in Western Washington, we're, we're focusing kind of on the other two projects primarily. And then other projects, Great Sunflower Project meant down here as another organization, but that's really just watching a particular sunflower blooms in your yard to see what critters come to them. So there's a lot of fun things that you can do. So this is just some information about how you can go about finding our um, website and our social media handles. And then I'm going to do here, uh, and we'll give people a chance to ask questions. I'm going to go ahead and back out of here and post these some of these links in the chat. And um, let's see here. I don't see any questions. Is that right? Am I looking at the right screen here? Yeah, I'm not seeing any yet either. Um, I just allowed, turned on 
the ability for everybody to unmute. So you probably got a thing saying you can unmute. So please go ahead and unmute if you'd like to ask your questions or type it in. So I just wanted to say that the, our local nursery is carrying more of the plants that are labeled be safe now. So I was really thrilled about that. You still have to look pretty close, but, um, <clears throat> But there yeah. are some of the, some of the perennials that are labeled that have tags that say be safe. So that's what I look for. Because when I've asked, they generally can't tell me where they came from or if they use the pesticides or, sorry, the systemics. And um, yeah. so Gardens locally does not use any of the uh, neonics. So, but they don't always have that on their labels. So look for Skagit Garden plants too. Yeah, you know, the unfortunate thing about labeling is that plants will say pollinator friendly or bee friendly, but there is no common definition or legal definition of what that means. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not been treated. Um, sometimes what it means is that the plant is attractive to pollinators, right? So there are plants like coneflowers or plants that have kind of a platform shape on top that are great for hummingbirds that tend to attract hummingbirds. So they may be a hummingbird, I mean, not hummingbird, uh, butterfly. So they may be a butterfly friendly plant in that sense, but it doesn't necessarily mean they've not been treated with insecticides. So um, so it is, that's why it's kind of incumbent on us to try and do that research. Because unfortunately, it's something that, you know, we've, we've Xerxes has been working on to try and get some consistency with that labeling so that people can use that. Because it's hard for, you know, how many consumers are going to necessarily go to that, to that effort. But um, that's why we're trying to provide a lot of guidance in terms of how to talk to a nursery to get those questions answered. So it's really good to leave the stalks over winter, but then in the spring, you really want to clean them up. What's your guideline for when it's safe? You know, usually um, most of our pollinators are coming out in, depending on the weather, in April and May. And so usually May, I would say May to June would be a good time because everyone should be out and about by then. Bumblebees, um, yeah, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but bumblebees are one of the earlier, you, me and my all might have noticed this, one of the earlier critters, um, bees that come out. They come out earlier in the season than honeybees do. So they've got a couple advantages. They've got, well, they're fuzzy, which enables them to be able to, to deal with um, a little bit cooler temperature. They also, bumblebees are the one of the primary pollinators of tomato plants. Um, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's because they're a buzz pollinator, which is um, a critter that actually, so they will actually grab onto the tomato plant, shake it, shake the pollen off. Some plants have pollen that's especially sticky. And so they need a buzz pollinator to get that pollen off. Um, but they're, yeah, they're one that come, ones that come out earlier, but usually not before in this area. I don't usually see them much before April. And then there was, like, I think, a question about, um, is it safer to plant seeds to avoid pesticides? Definitely. So planting, making sure that the plant, there are nurseries you can look at. You can search for them online. There are nurseries, including small nurseries that, that guarantee that they don't grow with ne neonics. Um, looking for organic places that only sell organic. And then, um, of course, Growing, growing things yourself so that you completely absolutely know how it was treated and how it wasn't treated is the best solution. So I'm glad that you brought that up, buying seeds or planting seeds. Exchanging seeds with folks growing your own plants is definitely the way to go when you're able to. Other questions? Are people what 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 bees and other insects are people seeing around? I, it took a long time for the mason bees to get going this year, but they're really humming now. Mm -hmm. So, what's your favorite? Um, you said your husband built some some mason bee houses. Did he mm -hmm. drop holes in wood, or what? What sort of? 
houses yeah. To yeah he just took blocks of wood um similar to in the image that i showed and then um it's a three eight inch drill hole and so you just drill those um you drill it enough for them to put 10 uh i don't remember offhand but the link that i shared about maintaining them tells you how long the drill how long the hole needs to be okay um ideally there's enough for for them to lay up to 10 which is about what they'll do they'll do one or two mason bees will do one or two sleeves of or of compartments of ten apiece, and that's about it for them for the summer. The female. So, how do you clean those um, out if you've drilled a hole? So, what you can do is actually soak them in a solution with a little bit of bleach and water, um, and then dry them out really good. It's also a great idea to alternate them so that you're if you have more than one that you can let one. Um, lie vacant for a year or so after you've treated treated it so that you can substitute and move them out. And then um, sometimes what you can get and often nurseries, this is usually what nurseries sell are actually those sleeves. So it might be like a hollow compartment and then there's sleeves that you put into it like little straws that are the, the housing. Um, and those it's a good idea to, those are usually just made of kind of really thin wood or willow uh, or bamboo actually, um, those are good to dispose of each year. So not to use the same ones year after year. Right. But you're, when you drill a hole, how do you get the bees out or, or do you have them so you can take it apart? Well, they'll come out in the spring. Okay. And so, so you wait for them to come out and then clean the hole. Okay. Right, yeah, that makes right. sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one interesting thing, uh, Stellar's Jays apparently have, I was talking to a guy that uh, runs a nursery the other day, have, or actually Wild Bird Center um, store, have figured out that mason bees can, can, mason bee boxes, that that strange shaped wooden thing can contain yummy snacks. And so they'll actually pull them out. And so you can now get little screens, <laughs> allow the mother bee to get in there and the young ones to fly out but that don't allow the Stellar's J to get their beak in. <laughs> I've been using, I've had a lot of really good luck lately with the, the reeds. Um, I seem to get mm -hmm. better luck with those than with the, so with the my own for a while, but I got a lot of other things in that weren't mason bees, which was great. I mean, but, and I, some, sometimes you're supposed to clean those out before, you know, the winter. Anyway. Yeah, and some I just noticed somebody had asked about tips for meadow growing. Um, on the website, yeah, there are there are lots and lots of fact sheets on there. And there are um two that I can think of offhand, one of one of which is about kind of just preparing the field for the meadow for sowing seeds um to to, to grow in the meadow. And then I think the other is really focusing on the different varieties different parts of the country, which ones are going to tend to perform best and provide the most habitat value. So yeah, definitely a lot of resources if you've got um, if you've got enough land to have a meadow, which is a huge advantage. Does anyone have a favorite insect? <laughs> I can't think of a favorite because there are just so many, but I I was in um, Tanzania in February and got to see dung beetles, which I had always wanted to see. So they're those little guys that are rolling balls of dung. Um, I never, when I got there, I realized I never really understood what that was about. Um, does anyone know what that's about? Why they're rolling those balls across the savannah? <laughs> Don't they lay eggs in them or something? Exactly, they do. So what they'll do is they actually move it to an area that they've excavated or that they've found that's a little bit underground. So when they're rolling, uh, and we saw this over and over again, when they're rolling the ball, it's usually the male is rolling it, the female is riding on top. When they get to the site, then she will lay eggs in there. And then that's what the offspring will eat when they're when they're starting to grow. And there are four different categories of dung beetles. Um, 
there's the, the ones that roll. There's some that just live underground and apparently um, are getting parts of the dung and then setting up their own shop. There's a category of dung beetles that are, um, they call them klepto something or other, but they only steal dung from other beetles. They never roll it themselves. <laughs> they only steal it. <laughs> so yeah, that was really beetle heaven to be able to see those guys in action. Um, and we have dung beetles here, you know, there are, but I think those are the ones that people have seen in nature films, you know, rolling across the savannah with giraffes stepping around them. And... <laughs> well, I was in Costa Rica in 1999 and I saw leaf cutter ants and I loved oh, yeah. them. Loved them. I, I, I was trying to take pictures really close. I had a bad camera, so it was just bad, but they're so strong and they're just taking those leaves and then taking them underground <laughs> and oh I loved it I loved it I, I had know a friend they go are. to Costa Rica yeah I was like did you see the leaf cutter and she goes yeah we did but then like she would point them out but some of the people the land that they were on they didn't want the leaf cutter ants for some mm -hmm. reason I guess because they you know they destroyed the trees or or some I don't know you know right like I'm like okay she's like yeah they were spraying and I was like no but it always amazes me I have to see I get so sad when I see people just pesticide you know pesticizing I don't even know if it's a word but I just I, I have a sadness when I see that um I guess I just wanted to say that apparently but yeah yeah we Just, have leaf cutter bees here that we will do, cut yeah. in circles. We do, yeah, in, yeah. in roses and other plants. I knew one lady who was on one of our garden <laughs> tours, and she thought it was the neighbors playing tricks on her. <laughs> and she saw these perfect circles in her plant leaves, and I've seen them in in, in my yard, and and they really do look bizarrely uniform. But um, it's wow, really that's cool. Yeah. So, Catherine, you might want to t tell about what they do with those. I think you touched on it, but. Oh, leafcutter ants. So leafcutter ants are, um, are bees. Uh, leafcutter bees are the other, besides the alkali bees, are the bees that play an important role in alfalfa pollination. And so mm. they're actually, yeah, they're taking that, I believe. But I actually, um, now that you asked that, I think I was just assuming that they're taking it back to their young, to the nest, for food. But I need to check into that because it may be. Well, they may do that too, but I know they use oh. them in in the because I used to when I made when I use the 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 reed. I'm only getting mm -hmm. mason bees. When I did my own uh, wooden whatever with paper inserts, somehow I get a lot of leaf cutter bees. Mm -hmm. open them up because a lot of people think that you should clean out your mason bees in november or sorry october and and clean out the all the little things that eat them and whatever um and you can and then you you, you store them over you, you protect them over winter but the leaf cutter bees you don't want to do that and i would see little sections they they put some of the the green leaves around and then they also use the green circles to separate the mason bees use mud but they right right use the and they may be feeding them and, and actually the young may be eating those too but they use definitely use them to line the tunnels yeah yeah i just looked at i just looked that up right as you said that and okay. you're right i should know that well yep. they use them for to construct their nests yep in between so yeah, I was talking, we were talking earlier about just some of the materials that they use. Um, I'm not sure. I know that resin was mentioned as one of the things, in addition to mud and leaves that resin and sap are used. I'm not sure I'm going to need to look up which critters or which bees are using that for the partition in between. But it's interesting that there's such variation in terms of what makes a good wall for your cell. <laughs> And I hadn't thought about know. what makes oh, a good food food source too. Yeah, yeah, and people, I'm you all may know this, but the um, people refer to bee bread. So that's when the female is um, laying the eggs, and then she's putting a little bit of sustenance in there for them when they hatch out. 
And so that's really this mixture made with pollen um, and nectar that they are then able to snack on. I don't know if any of the photos really had a good, showed a good image of that, but I love the idea that they're in that little room with a snack <laughs> until for months on end until they come out and meet the world. And it's such a short life once they actually hatch and come out. Yeah. I have a question, Kathleen, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah. I've been doing mason bees for a long time now, and, it be, and the pests are becoming more and more and more. Crown, local crown bees has been, <laughs> keeps listing new ones. But I'm wondering, are solitary bees, and yet we're doing a classic human thing of aggregating them into blocks, whereas uh -huh. they're bees. I mean, are we just creating buffets and kind of messing with the natural order? as well as cleaning the cocoons, taking them out individually so they don't have to work their way out through each other. Right. I'm beginning to question all this stuff about farming bees. If we're just... <laughs> right. You know, I have, um, I have talked to folks in Xerxes who have, um, I, I think kind of as a general rule, who often recommend as much as you can do in terms of providing habitat for bees and other wildlife, as opposed to relying on structures that, as you say, um, weren't there to begin with. They survive without the craze, <laughs> without the mason bee craze. Um, if you're doing other things in your yard that are actually helping them out, providing other types of uh, habitat for them, um, like the stems, um, mason bees are smaller. There's actually even smaller bees that, that really rely on those stems. But I believe mason bees too, depending on the plant, like a sunflower can use those. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they do have other resources. They just don't have other resources when it's one after another kind of manicured lawn, right? And so I I think it really, um, I've I've noticed the same thing that you mentioned in terms of we start to try and address the problem of needing more habitat and then there will be other creatures whether they're stellar jays or other insects that will figure out the value of this for themselves um, and it's not because it was constructed we don't know how much of a problem that might have been uh, did we create the problem or exacerbate it because it wasn't there to begin with so I do um, you know we did create all the mason bee blocks for folks, because I think the one advantage to me, I'm really interested always in helping uh, children in particular, because they form their attitudes towards animals so early on, helping them grow to appreciate insects. And so that has been, that was valuable when we kind of delivered all these mason bee boxes to folks in our neighborhood, because then we would talk to kids about them. I drag some of my coworkers from the zoo over, <laughs> our entomologist to come and talk. And then people would watch them on their porch. So I think there was educational value in doing that. But in terms of a solution, I, I tend to think that you're right, that, that leaning on the side of trying to do as much to enrich your habitat as possible without a, artificial condos is probably the way to go if you're able to, yeah. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you, Catherine, especially oh, definitely. for bringing such a marvelous program. So we'll see thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I did put those, um, I did put those links on there. But again, if you go to the Xerxes website, and if you look under the library, you'll see that there's a million different fact sheets. So um, definitely take advantage of that. And, and let us know if there's any Thing else we can do for you. <laughs> really appreciate you offering to, to speak to us today. Thank you. Oh, definitely. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bye.